I should say there's been a lot of negatives in the last year for everybody, I have to say. But one thing about COVID is it's as a cognitive control researcher, it's been just a wealth of real world examples because we all had to change our behavior you know, overnight in all kinds of crazy ways and follow rules and things like that. And so I've, I grabbed an example from the last year uh, to, to kick us off here. So, okay, so these two pictures should look pretty similar to you. Okay, these are both pictures of my of an entryway to my house, okay? And I mean, there's some differences you could see here, right? Like there's some, obviously they were taken at different times of day. There's some like differences in lighting and things like that. But there's a really important difference between these two pictures, a really important one. Now, this one on the left was taken before May 8th, 2020. And the one after, was, on, the, on the right was taken after May 8th, 2020. And on that day, May 8th, 2020, is when Rhode Island passed its law that, or passed an order that said, you have to wear a mask, a cloth mask over your face as soon as you leave the house. Okay, so at, at that point, sort of overnight, if you weren't somebody who was wearing a mask already, you had to change your behavior or else you got, you got fined, right? Even though you'd, you entered an environment, a context, right, which is um, the same as you would do, behave differently the day before, but now you have to do something new, right? You have to, you have to now grab a mask. Okay, and so this gets at a really um, kind of a central idea about cognitive control, right? If you, if you imagine control, the control problem being have a, having some input features that we um, see about the world, and then you have to produce some outputs, right? So these little circles represent the input features, right? And then you have some outputs, right? Which were the behaviors you take, right? You have to have the same, um, you're essentially, your problem is having the same inputs, right? And then producing very different outputs based on maybe an internal representation, in this case, the, the context of being, of being COVID and so forth. Okay, and so um, the definition I'm going to work with today for flexibility of cognitive control is that it allows the same input to lead to different outputs, depending on internally maintained factors like goals and rules and context. Okay, and so with that definition in mind, then a control representation, which is my main focus here, um, is, is any representation that enables a flexible mapping between those inputs and outputs. Okay, based on those internally maintained factors. So um, it, it doesn't have to be the inputs themselves or the responses, but rather it's any representation that allows for that mapping to take place. And most theories in cognitive control make some uh, commitment to a control representation. Okay, so for a number of theories out there, and I, and I put a lot of the work that, that I've done over the years in this bucket, right, that control representation is the context itself essentially just re representing the context and working memory or those internal features provides state support, right? It provides a signal which you can foreground the, what di distinguishes these two um, input states and allows you to, to choose the right output, okay? But there's also a host of theories of cognitive control um, that um, posit a more integrated control representation, right? And in fact, I, I, you know, which include not just the context, but perhaps uh, integration between the inputs and outputs and the, and the context itself. In fact, seminal work from uh, Elliot Hazeltine here at Iowa, right, has pointed at a task file representation, which is exactly that type of control representation. And I should say that's really influenced our thinking a lot. And I'm gonna come back to that um, later in this talk. Um, Elliot was way ahead of us on this, but um, we're, we're finally catching up. So anyway, um, so, so with that in mind, then the control representation, though, regardless of your theoretical take, is really important. This is a central property of control. And so understandably, we want to understand more about it. And there's been a lot of work on the content of these control representations, right? Specifically, uh, they typically focus on the lateral prefrontal cortex because of the long association of the frontal lobes with cognitive control that we all are aware of. Um, and they have tried to determine what are the features of tasks that you can find encoded by PFC neurons. And people have used both, done this both in electrophysiology in animals, as well as in studies in fMRI. Um, and what, and the, the kind of, and this is a, I'm showing you here a, a meta-analysis actually from Alex Woolgar of regions of the brain that code multiple aspects of a task, the rule, the input, the response, and so forth, okay? And the kind of consensus finding from all these studies is that most task relevant features are encoded by prefrontal neurons. Okay, so it, um, if not all of them, okay, you'll find in some, in some form. But an aspect of the control representation that hasn't received as much attention, at least in cognitive control research, find in other domains, is the organization of those control representations. And what I mean by their organization is how does the neural population represent different combinations of inputs in its patterns of neural firing? And what I'm gonna argue is that this is a really important property 
of the neural representation because it constrains what other neurons can read out of that population. And so it constrains neural computation. And I'm gonna to focus today on a particular property of that um, organization called representational dimensionality. And this is um, the technical definition is this would be the number of bases you need to describe the different patterns a neural population exhibits across its inputs. But let me kind of try to give you this little um, uh, illustration to, to make this a little more concrete. Okay, so imagine that I have um, a, say two neural populations. They're not big populations. Each one consists of three neurons, okay? Um, and they're in this, say this, uh, this person's brain, okay? And, and we present her with a, um, a, a stimulus, okay? This a circle that has a black outline, okay? So we'll, we'll, these neurons may fire to that, okay? And I can characterize the pattern of neural activity in this population as a location in this three-dimensional space, right? So this is sort of the firing over these three neurons, right? When I presented a circle, let's say I presented the circle six times, right? If they're, if they're coding it consistently, they're gonna have a, a similar pattern, right? And it's gonna have a similar location in this, in this neural population space. Okay. Now, of course, I can present other things. I can present, for instance, other colors and shapes, like a red square, for example, and I'll get different firing patterns in my populations, right? Um, and uh, what what you can see is that each of these, right, as I'm changing the, the say the shape to the square or the color, is going to have a different location in this neural population space. Um, now, this one on the left, which I'm calling the low dimensional representation, um, what you'll see is that the the pattern right, of, of activity right, or the space of activity that's um, characterized by those patterns right, is, it's, can be described actually in two dimensions in this case. I've we deliberately created it like a plane, okay? And even so, and this is actually an interesting diff confusion that comes up or not an interesting one, a common confusion is that when we say dimensionality, I'm not referring to the number of neurons, right? When I'm saying representational dimensionality, I mean the number of bases needed to describe the variance in these, in these patterns of activity. So in this case, it's sort of a, a plane, right? And this other represent, um, neural, represent, neural population can also represent all these inputs, but it does it um, in a three-dimensional shape, this polygon, okay? It's hard to see in this two-dimensional slide, but this one is kind of projected outward towards you, okay? So this is meant to represent. Okay, and they're both representing the same inputs, but with different organization. And this has a really important um, uh, impact on what can, you can read out of these populations. So um, for example, let's say we gave uh, this person this rule where if it's a square, you press right, if it's a circle, you press left, okay? So the way we usually think about neural computation is though there, these, you know, these, um, there's sort of a, a, a hyperplane or a subspace Okay, we can project onto that maximally separates the, the firing pattern for, for square versus circle. Okay? And so when you make that decision, I, I'm, I'm drawing a, a linear hyperplane right, up through that, uh, that subspace so I can put all the squares on one side and the circles on the other. Okay? And you can do that in this low dimensional representation. And you further, you can see that it's, it has this property of it's generalizing, it's collapsing over the irrelevant dimension in the way I've drawn this is set up, right? In the sense that it's not placing much distance between the colors here, it's putting much more distance between the shapes. Okay, so in other words, I put in a, it's not being drawn by the, diff the difference along this irrelevant dimension in this case. Now the high dimensional representation can also do this, this readout, um, though it's more sensitive to these differences in color. Nonetheless, I can find a hyperplane where I can um, I can draw this plane. But, this, but its sensitivity here does make the high dimensional representation more sensitive to noise, right, than the low dimensional one, which is, which is a, a negative aspect of the high dimensional representation, all right. They can also do color, of course, it's a different in both of these representations, just a different um, subspace, a different hyperplane. Okay, but now what if I wanna do in, um, this rule? Okay, an aura rule this is the kind of thing my lab would love to do to, do to participants, right? Um, so here you've got a, uh, your, if you see a red square or a black circle, you press right. If you see a red circle or a black uh, square, you press left. Okay, so that's effectively these vertices on these two populations. And what you can see is that there's no way I can draw a linear hyperplane through this low dimensional representation in which I'll be able to put these two on one side and those two on the other side. Okay, I'll either have to do two classification decisions inefficiently, right, in serial, or I'll have to do some sort of nonlinear bound. However, the higher, the higher dimensional representation does permit this, right? There's actually a conjunction subspace that I can use to, to make this decision. Okay, and what this illustrates is, and you have to, again, you'd have to do some nonlinear thing with a low dimensional one. 
is a, is a well-known property of dimensionality in these populations, right? There's a, there, the more, the higher the dimensionality, representational dimensionality, the more separation you have among these neural patterns across multiple different um, possible classifications. They're more expressive. You can read out more from them, okay? Um, so what this represents then is a trade-off between generalizability and separability. Low dimensional representations are general, more generalizable. They'll discard irrelevant information. They'll collapse across, um, across noise. They'll benefit from similarity, right, in making their classes, but they're less separable. So they're gonna, they're gonna um, be less uh, able to, to you, they're less expressive in terms of what you can read out, okay? Conversely, high dimensional representations are gonna um, be less generalizable and sensitive to noise, but they um, exhibit higher separability. Okay, so what I'm gonna um, do today, I'm gonna give you, this is essentially my conclusion slide. So if you're like kind of tired from lunch and you wanna sleep from here on out, that's fine, you've gotten far enough. But I'm gonna tell you what I'm gonna tell you and then, I'm, then I'll go through the talk. Um, but basically what I'm planning to do is try to convince you that both generalizability and separability are crucial computational properties for cognitive control. Okay. And second, I'm going, to try to, I'm going to provide you evidence we have that both low and high dimensional control representations um, exist in the brain and are used by the brain. Um, and, and specifically, I'll show you some evidence we have from that prefrontal parietal networks encode a low dimensional control representation for generalizing behavior to new settings. I'll show you um, evidence that control representations that integrate multiple task features drive action selection, and these are verifiably high dimensional, okay? And finally, um, if I get there, and I put a couple asterisks here, because I think this is more aspirational. I don't think I'm gonna have time to show you this. We, I'll show you, I would like to show you preliminary evidence we have that the prefrontal cortex has the capacity to hold these high dimensional representations as well, which is very interesting and contrasted with this bit up here. Okay, so let's, let's dive in, shall we? So let's start with the generalizability side of this trade-off, right? So um, this is probably the more widely accepted or acknowledged um, advantage for cognitive control, right? Generalizability is really important in use settings, right? We're often in settings where we have to control our behavior without the benefit of feedback, right? And we have to draw analogies and make inferences based on, on prior behavior. So again, let's, let's grab a COVID example. So if let's say you've been going to your favorite uh, grocery store and you've been obeying these sort of tick marks on the wall to stand six feet behind the person in front of you and proper social distancing. Um, and then and you do that routinely and you sort of built up that pattern of behavior. And now you decide to go to, um, this is actually the, I think an opening of like the iPhone or an, a new iPhone or something that someone took a picture of, I grabbed from the web. But anyway, let's say you go to this event, all right? You see this person and you don't have the helpful tick marks and you've never been to this event before and you don't have the opportunity for lots of, uh, of, of attempts where you get up close to that person and they yell at you or you get COVID or something, right? You have to just behave right this time. So you need to be able to draw an analogy to the similar situation you were in before and behave appropriately, right? And stand six feet, six feet away from them, right? And so this is actually a really you know, common and ubiquitous aspect of our, of our lives. It's also at the sort of at the heart of human kind of what we think of as, as flexible behavior in new situations, okay? So we, we draw inferences based on abstract, in other words, low dimensional control representations. Um, and a lot of previous research, I didn't even listen to references, there's been a lot of work to suggest that um, the prefrontal cortex has um, the capacity to hold abstract representations um, of different types. There's actually though been surprisingly few cases um, of where we've seen, um, uh, and also there's, I should say there's evidence in behavioral work showing that people can generalize and transfer right, task sets to new, new settings without feedback and behave. But there actually hasn't been a lot of, of evidence, say, using fMRI or other methods, methods to show that the prefrontal cortex actually supports those kind of um, high dimensional representations we use for generalization in a case where we can verify people have done so without feedback, right, have generalized their behavior without feedback. And so I'm gonna start with a study um, uh, that is looking at whether lateral prefrontal control networks support low dimensional task representations that we might use for task generalization. And this is work that was done by Avi Vedia, who's a postdoc in my lab. Um, and it, he'll be published this year in, in eLife. And Avi, I mean, one reason why there isn't, we think there isn't a lot of data out there like this experimental is it's really hard to do these experiments. And so Avi just, it, it, to design these experiments, even though I think it's very common in everyday life, doing it in the lab is super hard. And Avi really had a, it was a heroic act to put this design together, but I'll, I'll walk you through what he did. Okay, so 
the basic task was like this. Um, people were, um, were, I guess there was sort of a, a fanciful cover story here. I guess they were wandering through this kind of these kingdoms where there'd be these contexts like this, um, this mountain okay, to be presented up here. Okay, and, the, and the, the context picture would be different images like that. And their job is to sell photographs in these different contexts. And, um, and so in this case, a, a photograph of a hand. Um, the people you're selling to, the things you're selling to are these sort of goblins. And, the go and I guess the goblins are fickle creatures. And so there are some uh, categories of pictures they like and some they don't like. Um, and you have to kind of figure this out initially based on trying to sell things to them, okay? So you choose whether you want to sell to this, this picture or not to the goblins who, that live in this mountain region. Um, and you get points. And, you, and whether you decide to sell or not, you're going to see the feedback, but you only get the points, of course, if you sell. Okay, so what, what Avi did is he had people do a series of these choices in the same context using, say, the same category, different individual pictures um, for a while in, in kind of a mini block. And then he would switch to new mini blocks. So you might get a new category of item that you have to learn about, right, the preferences of the goblins here. You might also get it, go into a new context, right? So say these are now the goblins that live in the island area, and you try to sell them these various objects. And it'd be the same categories that would show up there and so forth. Okay. So, you go through multiple of these. So during initial training, you're essentially trying to learn a reward structure that I've schematized here. So um, I'll, I'll try to unpack this grid for you. So these are the different categories of pictures that are being sold. These uh, images are the, are the nine contexts that you uh, might encounter. And here's the probability of reward, getting rewarded of the goblins liking these pictures in each of these contexts. Okay. Now they weren't presented in this order. I've grouped them this way because these contexts all share the same reward structure. Okay, in other words, goblins in, in the beach, the forest, and the volcano all seem to like hands and don't care about foods and leaves. Okay, um, and so though we don't say it explicitly, people um, have the opportunity to kind of build uh, an association among these, right? A latent state which says that these contexts are related to each other because the goblins who live there have a similar have similar preferences. All right, so people go through, they use feedback and they, and they build this structure. Now we give them three new categories okay, in a new session. Okay, now they're gonna get faces and animals and objects. Okay, and, um, and in this case, um, the reward structure is gonna be different, right? So here, for instance, because it's different categories, let's say these goblins in the volcano like faces and animals and they don't like objects. Okay, so they'll, they'll learn that about this context, this A3 context that they don't like objects, for example. Okay, and they'll learn about each of these other contexts. But the interesting question we have is if they built this association, okay, um, they might generalize this to the other contexts that also share this latent state. And the way we can test that is we've held out these contexts during this phase where we're still showing feedback. In a final generalization phase, we give no feedback anymore, but now we give them these faces, animals, and objects in the two held out contexts. Okay. And if they're able to behave optimally, that means that the only way they could do that is because they've drawn the inference that these are all related to each other, given that latent um, state, and therefore they can, um, this will sort of be inherited, right, by, the, by these other contexts. Okay. And so again, without feedback at this point. And we scan during this phase and also um, look at behavior. Okay, so first off, we have, there's a lot in this paper um, that I'm not going to go through. We do a lot of different um, things. There are different ways of modeling the way inference could happen and so forth. But um, to keep it relatively simple, uh, these are the learning curves, right? During initial training, new category training, and generalization, and each curve represents one of the mini blocks that I showed you. Okay, what you see going from the first mini block on. And what you can see are, um, during the initial training and new category training, right, is standard um, kind of power learning curves, right, showing uh, improvement up to an asymptote as they acquire these reward probabilities. The important thing is during generalization. Again, these are new categories, these are, are, sorry, not new categories, these are new contexts that they've, well, old contexts with new categories, right, that they haven't gotten before, and they're not given any feedback, but you can see within a couple trials, they reach um, ceiling on these and they're behaving optimally. So the only way they could do that is through generalization. And moreover, we know that they're maintaining that latent state representation. Um, and we had a couple ways of assessing this, but one was by looking even at their switch costs, at their performance, okay? If you go from trial to trial while they're making their choices, you can look at the the, their switch costs of their decision when say just the context changes. Let's say you go from um, say this beach to this forest within the same latent state, okay? But we can also look at switch costs when they go from 
say this, the, the forest to the desert. That means it's, it's a switch of context that's identical to this switch of context. But if they're representing the latent state, you'll see an additional switch cost because of that latent, latent straight, state switch. And that, in fact, that's what we see, right? That there's an ad additional cost of, of crossing that latent boundary, right? That's only there if they're representing the structure in this way. Okay, so people then, we verify people are using an abstract task representation during generalization. Now what's happening in the brain? Um, so the, um, we use representational similarity analysis. And I, I'm thinking most of you are probably familiar with what this is, but if you aren't, I'll give a quick, a quickie version of it because it's gonna come up again later in the talk as well. Um, basically for each of these combinations of uh, context and category, we're gonna get a brain response, right? We're gonna pull a, a set of voxels and we can do this with a moving spotlight. So we just pull a set of voxels all over the brain that'll have a pattern of activity. Okay, and all we're gonna ask is, for each of these different combinations, how uh, similar or actually dissimilar, one minus the correlation, are each of these patterns with each other? And we build a table out of that. So in other words, um, for instance, these two that might share the same context might be fairly similar because of that shared thing. And so they have a, a lower score than say, these two that don't share much at all, right? That are much higher, okay? We, can, we just basically build a matrix like that. All right, and what's nice about this is that we have different predictions for what that ma similarity matrix should look like, depending on whether we're looking for a latent state or say just the context, right? A latent state, re recall, should sort of merge, right? Or, or abstract over these differences in context, say between the beach and the forest, because they're, they share a, a, that higher order latent state, okay? A context representation, however, would, would find these to be different, right? It would distinguish those two, be, differentiate those two because of the, the change in context, even though they share a latent state. And so we can ask as we go around the brain, what are the, these patterns of voxels represent? Are they latent state or say just the context, okay? What we find in our moving spotlight, or what we found was that indeed, um, frontal parietal networks are representing this abstract task representation while people are doing this task. In this case where we've got this verifiable representation. I should note, by the way, that this surprised Avi and, and me because we actually had, we pre-registered our, our predictions actually and that the, um, we thought, so you can go look at them. We thought it was going to be um, a hippocampus and medial prefrontal cortex because everybody was telling us that, that latent states are represented in, in orbital and medial frontal cortex, but we didn't find that here. <laughs> and instead we found these, um, these frontal parietal control system uh, uh, networks supporting this. Now, in terms of just the context itself, we don't find much evidence of, for that being represented in lateral prefrontal cortex. We found, if anything, just in sort of ventral temporal areas specifically. Okay. So just to sort of, you know, at this, so what the, my reason for showing you this is that people obviously can build abstract low dimensional task representations, right? And they can use them to generalize behavior through inference. And so this is another example of that in this experiment. And moreover, what we show is that dorsolateral and frontal parietal networks can support these abstract representations, okay? So with the brain clearly, and control systems clearly support the generalization side of this, of this trade-off. Okay, but what about the separability side? And this is really important because I think it's, this has been largely ignored in the cognitive control literature with a few exceptions, right? But there are a lot of advantages to separability for control, I'd argue. Um, and so uh, one of the big reasons is that separable representations, when a representation is high dimensional, it's separable, it's gonna allow similar in inputs to produce distinct outputs, which is effectively the cases like I started this talk with. Right, where you have the same set of inputs and there's really a very minimal um, difference, right? It's really one feature, namely that you're in the middle of a worldwide pandemic that's distinguishing the kinds of, of, um, of outputs you should have in this particular case, okay? And so this could be very useful in the, in the, for controlling your behavior kind of efficiently in those situations. Um, moreover, the enhanced expressivity you get from high dimensional representations, which I introduced at the beginning. In fact, you can read out lots of different information from the same population can help flexibility. And finally, um, the uh, separability may just may allow you to, to reduce task interference by routing tasks right through separate channels. So they don't end up being, don't overlap and cause interference. And there's, and this is related um, potentially to some very nice work that Sebastian Muslick and uh, John Cohen have published recently or have, have, have um, in a couple different places. Um, we're showing that multitasking costs can be reduced when in these, these are neural network simulations, but that as you expand the, the um, sort of the dimensionality of these, of these 
of these networks, it allows for or you or you allow for, for task information to be multiplexed and routed separately, and it can reduce the um, the task interference. Okay, so there's a lot of potential advantages for control for that. Okay, so is there evidence then that the brain is using high dimensional control representations, um, right, to control action selection? Okay, and so I'm going to now show you a line of work that. Um, a postdoc in the lab at Sushi Kikimoto is, is doing, along with another postdoc, Apurva Bandari, um, uh, as well, um, on uh, conjunction representations that drive action selection. This actually starts with uh, at Sushi's graduate work that he did with Ulrich Meyer um, at University of Oregon. And Ulrich is now uh, collaborating with us on this line of works. But I'm going to start with actually at Sushi's graduate work because it sets up the basic task and the, 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 the conjunction representation that's going to be very important. Uh, for these ideas. So the basic task that they, that, that they ran uh, goes like this. It's, it's you, um, at the beginning of each trial, you get a queue. And that queue, I apologize, this is a very busy slide. Ignore everything here except the top row here for, for now. I should have animated all this, but I didn't do the usual thing. Um, so you get a queue right at the beginning, and it has a rule. It says horizontal, for example. Okay, there actually were three different rules in this version of the experiment, vertical, horizontal, and diagonal. Okay, let's say it's horizontal. That rule tells you how to make, how to make your response based on the stimulus. Okay, it's like a transformation on the stimulus. So if it says horizontal, if this is the queue, the stimulus, you would, you would um, press a key on a square keypad um, that's a horizontal transformation away from this stimulus. If it's vertical, you'd press the one below. If it's, if it's diagonal, you'd press the one at a diagonal. And so what's, what's nice about this, and these are all laid out here for you, is this is exactly, it's like an experimental case of, of, of me leaving the house with my mask, right? Is that the same stimulus can produce uh, any of the different responses depending on the, the, the rule you're in. So the same input right, produces very different outputs depending on whatever you're maintaining. Okay. Um, now what they did is they, um, this was done using EEG. Um, they took this, uh, the, the, the spectral frequency profile right across, the, across electrodes and they did a, um, a decoding of the stimulus response mapping um, based on that spectral EEG pattern at each moment in time. And what it allows them to do is actually create a similarity profile, right, over all the different types of, um, uh, uh, the different types of trials, okay, which you can essentially do, it's the same, you can, it's like treating these, these features the same way we treat voxels and multi-voxel fMRI, right? You're just, do, you're doing essentially a pattern similarity analysis, but now, now your RSA is based on those, uh, on those features. That are decoded, um, and so and you can therefore um, look for a pattern that looks like the stimulus, a pattern that looks like the response, a pattern that looks like the rules. These are all the sort of the simpler low-dimensional components of the task, as well as a conjunction representation that is would be a unique pattern specific to that particular set of stimulus, rule, and response. Okay, and what they found um, was that. First off, you can see, a and they can do this in a time-resolved way, which is nice with EEG, right? You do it at each moment. And what you can see is that, you know, when the rule Q is presented, you get evidence for the rule. When the stimulus is presented, you get evidence for the stimulus. And of course, here's the response just before you respond. But critically, they found evidence also for this conjunction representation. And in, the, in terms of the T value, it looks weak, but it's actually highly reliable. It's been replicated several times. This is showing the significance down here. And most importantly about this conjunction representation, it was, this is showing the trial by trial prediction of single trial reaction time from each of those representations. It was the most predictive of single trial reaction time of all the things that decoded, including the response, right? The strength of the response representation. Okay, and so it seemed to be the ma a major determinant of, of behavior. So this is a great candidate. So Atsushi now comes, is now a postdoc in my lab, and this seems like a great candidate for a potentially high dimensional representation, right? If it's in, because it's integrated that way. So if the conjunction representation is integrated, it should increase separation. In other words, you should see an increase in representational dimensionality when, uh, when the, uh, in association with the representation of that conjunction. Okay, so we need to have a way of estimating representational dimensionality. Okay, and so we're going to use a method, and so what we use is a method that um, uh, Mattia Rigotti and, and Stefano Fusi, who are also collaborators with, this, with us on this work, that they used um, for uh, in, in electrophysiology in the non-human primate. And what this, uh, and here we're going to do it using EEG. And so what it does is recall that the main difference between, or one of the differences between the high dimensional and the low dimensional representation is that I could read out more pairwise classifications out of this, this high dimensional representation. So I'm going to exploit that fact 
to estimate dimensionality because there's a well-defined relationship between the number of, of arbitrary binary classes I can read out of a, a population and the dimensionality of that representation. Right? And this, this, is the, this is the basic relation. Okay, so basically what you do is you take all the classes. In this simple case where I've got a two by two design colors and shapes, it's just um, two to the fourth minus two possible classifications. And I do all of those and I count them up and I plug them into this equation. And that tells me the dimensionality. Of course, for more complicated experiments, the combinatorics are much bigger. So you're running, you're running lots and lots and lots of, cl of, of classifications. This is a very computationally intensive um, thing to do. And moreover, at Sushi is doing it at every point in time. Okay, but we get time resolved representational dimensionality, right, um, estimates as people do this task, okay? And so this is showing now the curve of the, of the change in representational dimensionality over time while people do this selection test. And what you see is in the phase following the stimulus, right, which is in the same range as when we saw the conjunction representation increase, right, there's a big expansion in dimensionality that happens, right, over this, over this period of time. Now, of course, this is the dimensionality essentially of the, of the electroencephalogram. We wanna know, is it related to the conjunction representation? Well, the answer is yes. Oh, first, let me say, I forgot before you say that. Um, it all, it's it, much like the conjunction is very much related to behavior. So the, the higher the dimensions, right, the better your, the, the faster people's response time, the more efficient they are, which is what you'd expect for, for a good separable representation. But that being said, is it related to the conjunction? So the actual uh, formation of the conjunction. So what we can do is we can take the RSA analysis and we bin um, the RSA, the trials based on the strength of the estimated RSA, okay? Okay, and essentially what we get is that the stronger that the, the conjunction, the stronger the task file, if you will, right? The more, the, the higher the separability, right? The higher the dimensionality we get. And so that's what you're, what's being plotted here, right? This has been, these, each of these is the dimensionality curve binned on the basis of the strength of the, of the, of the RSA of the conjunction. This is another way to plot the same thing, just showing you the correlation, right, between, the, between those two across individuals. Um, and, in, this is, and of the various representations, this is the only one that shows that as strongly as it does, right? This is not this, that this doesn't hold just for the rule or the stimulus of the response, but it's specifically related, that dimensionality change is specifically related to the strength of that conjunction representation. Okay. Moreover, and this is, uh, you know, uh, up till this point, um, it's, you, you know, to some degree, this should happen. If the conjunction is an integrated representation, if it's based on cells that are representing mixtures, unique mixtures of inputs, then you should expect this. Um, so maybe it kind of falls out anyway, but there's interesting dynamics in the dimensionality that we think are important to the response. Uh, and, and so if we response lock that dimensionality analysis, okay, so we actually go, we go from the response and now we, um, we do our dimensionality analysis that way. We find that the dimensionality changes in this time period and peaks around 200 milliseconds prior to the response consistently, almost across level, the strength of the, of, the, of the conjunction representation. And that's notably different than just when we can, can kind of detect the conjunction using RSA. This is actually a dynamic that's happening um, uh, with, the, with the dimensionality. We're seeing an expansion of the dimensionality in a, in a period that's right before it needs to be read out for the response. And in fact, and this is kind of interesting, um, if we do, we can do an analysis called um, temporal generalization analysis. So this is something that Mark Stokes had done a while back. And the way you basically do this is you do, you do decoding, you train your, your, your decoder at each point in time, and then you test it at all the other points. Okay, and, what, and if a representation is stable, right, if it's the same, then you'd expect that what you trained it on over at this point in time, at an early point in time, is going to be able to be decoded at a later point in time. If it's changing, if it's in flux, if it's dynamic, then you, you, you don't see that. Okay, what we see is that, again, this is response lock. In that same range, about 200 to 250 milliseconds, where we see this massive expansion of dimensionality, we also see a stabilization of that conjunction representation, right, in, uh, in time. Um, now, right now, this is just, we're observing essentially a, 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 a coincidence of these two things, right? We don't have evidence that this is causal. Um, and we're, we're right now pursuing experiments to actually test that. Um, but it's intriguing and it suggests, if we put everything I've said here together, right, that the formation of this, of a high dimensional integrated task representation that integrates all the various task elements is crucial for action um, planning, 
right, for, for action selection. And in fact, that that representation needs to have, you know, the highest dimensionality, the better, and it needs to stabilize in the period right before the response. And that's very intriguing to us. It's very much in line with um, uh, a lot of ideas about, uh, I mean, I keep bringing up the task file, but these kinds of ideas about and those advantages. Now, our, um, now here's a question. What if I have two action plans, okay, that I'm holding together, okay? Um, do I integrate those too, right? Is this thing, did you keep just like glomming these together into a higher and higher dimensional um, assortment, right, a representation, right? Um, and so to test this, at Sushi um, ran this experiment in which we basically, it just adapts the original version of the experiment, but now we're gonna provide two stimuli at the beginning of the trial, okay? We then provide people a cue and then uh, a, a rule cue, okay? And then, but we don't tell them initially which one of these is gonna be tested. And then we, then we cue one of them based on the color and they have to give that response. They have to, so they essentially have to prepare two action plans, right? There's a further manipulation here, right? Is that we, we um, have them prioritize one of the plans by telling them that, for instance, uh, in a queue that begins at the beginning of the block, that the green stimulus is 70% likely to be tested and the blue stimulus is 30% likely to be tested. Okay, so they can, um, they can prioritize, we can distinguish their ability to prioritize one action plan over the other one. And then, um, and then we do this test uh, consistent with these, with these percentages. So this is a way for us to test how people are maintaining, say, when you have multiple of these action plans, right, how they're being maintained together. Okay, so first thing to, to say about this um, is that um, uh, we see, so we're able to obviously decode the stimulus and the rule and so and the response, but we also find evidence that for both conjunctions, both the high and the low conjunction are decodable, so people maintain them both, right, during the, um, the preparation and go phase. There's a slight difference between them, right, in terms of their priority, right, such that um, the high is a little bit stronger than the low, not reliably so. However, once you do, um, once you give the cue, right, so if you test the high priority one, as was expected, right, with 70% likelihood, we see that that gets a much stronger response. You know, it stayed, it was high and it stayed high and the low goes down, right, in accordance um, with, its, with its, its use, for the, uh, with it being useful. And when you, but when we do the unexpected and we test the low probability one, you see that they, um, they start high and then the low rebounds back up again. Okay, and so it suggests that people can, can select each of these, um, these representations based on task demands, right, separate from one another. Um, and it, it's, it's actually very analogous to the way we think of gating operating within, within working memory. Okay. So what about now, are these being integrated? And this is, I think, the, the thing, I, the question I was asked. I asked to start. So first off, if we if we just if we um, look at the we do our dimensionality analysis again for each of these two conjunction representations, the high priority one and the low priority one, and we do the same same binning where we're binning our dimensionality analysis based on where the the um, the strength is, is goes from high to low of each conjunction. Right, we first reproduce the pattern we saw before. Right, that this each one of these is uh, appears to be a, a high a high dimensional integrated representation. But now if we do the opposite, so if, if it's the case that they're all part of the same, um, the same integrated representation, we also expect then the strength of, the, of, of each conjunction to affect the dimensionality of the other one, if that makes sense. We should, it, should go, it should go both ways, right? Because it's all part of the same representation. And that we do not find. So it, it seems as though in this case, when you have two actions, they're held, even though each one integrates its own action plan, it binds together the stimulus, the rule, and the response, when they have to be held separately and prioritized independently, um, or, or, or should, I should say distinctly, then we don't see integration between them. What's notable about this is that, um, when, this, that in this, as, when, the, when these are being held in this way, they actually seem to interfere with each other. So this is, this is a linear mixed model result, which I still have yet to find a good way to present these in ways that aren't confusing. So I apologize for the, um, the complex graph here. The thing to direct your attention to is this, um, are these coefficients, which are from the conjunction representation. And these are showing their, their effect, right, on um, behavior, on response time and error. Okay, and so the first thing to note is that a stronger conjunction and the high, of, for instance, for the high conjunct priority item, facilitates behavior. Right? If you have, a, if you, as we showed before, it's being represented in a strong way, it's going to improve performance. However, what's this this interaction term is the effect of having a strong 
um, conjunction on the other item when it gets tested. Okay, and what we see is an interference effect. So if you're representing, that's what this being up here means for both RT and error, right? Is that if you're maintaining these two representations and they're not being integrated together, the higher priority item, the stronger item is interfering with the, with the lower priority item at test. Right? Um, and so these, and, and they conflict with each other. Now, um, so non-integrated conjunctions interfere with selecting the response. Well, last thing we might ask is what happens though if you just had a distractor? Like if you just like, it, rather than having two, I, two things that I have to hold together that could potentially interfere with each other, let's say I just have one and I, and I have a distractor that I have, to, I have to resist, right? Is that gonna also be held separate from my, my, my representation? Okay, and so uh, in this experiment, um, Atsushi again adapted the original one, now simplified the rule. So you just have a simple stay or switch rule. And all that tells you is if um, when the stimulus appears at the beginning, um, down the road, you're going to get a probe. If it's the stay rule, you say whether the probe um, matches or mismatches the, remember, the queued location. If it's a switch rule, you, just, you say whether it matches or mismatches the, other, the unqueued location. Okay, it's a very simple task. But the crucial thing is that during the delay period, you get a presentation of a distractor. Okay, that appears. Um, and I should point out, there's a bunch of control conditions in this experiment that I'm not talking about today. There's, a, there's a, some of these where you have to update here. There's also in a different group of people, not in this group of people. Um, and uh, there's also a, an early test condition where sometimes this actually gets tested. So you do have to pay attention to whatever happens here. And I think that's important. But the critical thing is in this, for this group, these distractors are always ignored and they, um, uh, and they appear during this delay. Okay, and so the question is, what happens right, when, when this appears? What happens to the conjunction of the stimulus, the rule, and the, um, uh, at that point? Okay, and so these are, the, these are our results, and this, is, this study is still ongoing, so um, take this a little bit of a, a grain of salt. But what we find is that during the initial stimulus delay, okay, we see the, stand, the, the formation of the conjunction between the rule and target. Okay? But when the distractor appears, this blue trace is now a three-way conjunction between the rule, the target, and the distractor, right? And then when the test appears, you get a re-emergence of the rule target conjunction. So unlike the case I just showed that where you have two things you have to hold together, right? And prioritize one versus the other. In this case, where you're just resisting a distractor, we actually see that the distractor gets integrated into the representation. It forms a higher dimensional representation with the distractor and then it gets discarded at the end. Um, is resistant to distract. Okay, so just to um, sort of summarize then what I showed you about this. So this is evidence that we, the brain does indeed use a high dimensional conjunction representation to drive action selection. Um, and dimensionality peaks and the conjunction representation stabilizes shortly before responses are selected. Um, distinct conjunctions corresponding to different action plans can be maintained and prioritized without uh, integration, but are susceptible to interference with each other. And distractors are initially dis, uh, integrated into a higher dimensional representation and then discarded. We think this is really interesting, potentially the difference between these two cases, because it, um, it uh, and, and again, one of the things we're, we're interested in now and looking at, in particular this last case, is the degree to which that integration, right, putting it into a high dimensional representation actually makes it easier to resist distraction for the reason of the enhanced um, separability and expressivity of that representation. Once that, once that distractor is built into that representation, you can read out anything from it, including the clean representation without the distractor. And so um, we're, we're obviously looking at that speculation right now. We're looking at ways to test that hypothesis as well as some, as, as well as some other ones about why that's happening. But we think it's interesting the distractor does get integrated into that test product. Okay. As I suspected, I think I'm running a little bit low on time here. I don't know, how am I doing uh, with time? You've got, uh, you're at 45 minutes. Uh, you can take another five, 10, however much you want. We'll just come out of your discussion time. <laughs> so no, no questions asked. I'll just like dictate to everybody. Um, all right, I'm gonna, I'll try it and we'll see, where it, we'll, <laughs> we'll see what happens. Um, all right, so what, I, what I've shown you is evidence that the, the brain does represent a high dimensional representation, okay? The, um, uh, what I haven't shown you is that the prefrontal cortex is necessarily doing that, right? Is the, is, the, is the basis of that. And that's been a very hard problem. We have evidence from the monkey um, that 
uh, that, that the prefrontal cortex can maintain a high dimensional code, right? Particularly the, the study I mentioned before from Mattia Rigotti, right? So prefrontal uh, dimensionality was near maximal given the dimensionality of the task and the errors were associated with um, reduced dimensionality. So that dimensionality was behaviorally relevant akin to what I showed you today. But there's really not a lot in humans. And I think part of that has to do with method with, with that the most of the methods for estimating dimensionality rely on, on multivariate um, methods that um, are have been proven to be or are, are have shown to be very difficult in humans. Uh, and it may have to do with, with sort of uh, smaller voxel to voxel differences. All right, I've decided that given the time, I am gonna jump over this. So I'm just gonna um, so I'm happy to talk more in the QA or, or offline with people, but um, I'm going to I'm going to skip ahead and just say that uh, kind of and I and I apologize for who would like to see everything we did here, but the um, we have been we have an R with an R twenty one from NIH we actually been working on methods that um, allow us to estimate representational dimensionality but don't depend on voxel resolution and they rely on repetition suppression uh, actually and I, and I'm happy to talk more about that in the Q and A and we've done a lot of actually most of our work here has been methods work trying to verify that. And so what the map I'm showing you here is using that repetition suppression method. Um, and uh, it's a, and th this is not an activity map, okay? What this is, is a dimensionality map. So this is showing voxel by voxel, the level of the number of dimensions estimated using this method. While people made a decision, it's, a, it's um, during something we call the parity task. It's a categorization decision where you have to integrate multiple stimulus features. You know, in terms of like a face, a tone, and a, and a place, and, and, it, and in order to make a nonlinear um, categorization decision. So it's a, it's a decision that favors a high dimensional representation. And we find in that case that we, in, at least in this uh, preliminary data set, um, evidence indeed of a high dimensional capacity in the, in the PFC, right? That in fact, we, we found this was the, the point place of, of highest dimensionality estimated in this whole brain analysis. Okay, so I'll give you, to, so to conclude, so I've argued that both generalizability and separability are crucial computational properties for, for control representations, okay? And we have shown evidence for both low and high dimensional control representations in the brain, right? Evidence that the prefrontal parietal networks encode low dimensional control representations for generalizing behavior to new settings, that control evidence for control representations that integrate multiple task features to drive action selection and that are verifiably high dimensional. And then I, didn't really show you very, uh, I didn't convince you perhaps, but I showed you a map that suggests that prefrontal cortex um, has a, a capacity to hold high dimensional representations. So the question then you might ask then is, how does the brain then balance the use of both high and low dimensional representations, right? Given that they have advantages of both. And this is really, this is where we're going now. And it's really, I think this is a really interesting question to ask. Um, you know, one answer could be that it's a division of labor in the brain. There's certainly other examples of computational trade-offs in control, such as between flexibility and stability, and like, you know, the cor between cortex and striatum, for example, that um, where that's the that's sort of a solution to that trade-off. But another possibility is that there are dynamics by which dimensionality is controlled, even and I even showed how there are changes in dimensionality within a trial, right, from the EEG analysis that might also um, uh, balance this trade-off as, as, as neural populations sort of evolve in their activity. But something that really intrigues me is how learning and plasticity may, may affect this actually. And in particular, the implications it might have for the controlled to automatic continuing behavior. And there are different stories to tell here, but one that I think is really interesting is the idea that early on, and when you're entering new environments, right? When you're standing in line for that iPhone for the first time, um, low dimensional representations are useful because they allow any task to be constructed quickly, but, but with inefficient behavior, okay? Um, and so you're willing to kind of give up efficiency, right? In the interest of generalizability. But for something you do a lot, right? With practice and consolidation, we might be willing to sacrifice generalizability in the interest of being efficient, right? And, we, and so as a result, we're willing to invest in separability. And just a hint of data to suggest this. So this is data from Atsushi's experiment. They actually had um, a subset of subjects came back for a second session. And what we sat, found was, you know, here's the standard learning curve during session one. During session two, there was this big drop, right, or uh, improvement in behavior, okay, that happened uh, uh, later, right, which suggests a practice and consolidation effect. Well, here's the interesting thing is if we look at dimensionality between the two sessions, so this is the, the effect essentially I showed you before, showing you the, the upscaling of dimensionality as a result of the strength of the conjunction. This is from day one. After the consolidation phase, that's the, um, 
the relationship. So it's, it's, you get a stronger relationship between that, right? In other words, it's refining the integrated um, uh, representation with consolidation. So this is this intriguing idea, right? That over time, we actually build high dimensional representations that maximize separability because of the advantages that that conveys. We're willing to invest in it and give up a little bit on generalizability for certain tasks. And so it redefines the way we think about automaticity to some degree. All right, stop there. And I just want to thank the, the, the people who really do this work. I, I get to hang out in the office and sip coffee and things, and they really are the, are the intellectual and the, the motive force behind all of this. Um, uh, uh, Avi Vedia, the postdoc who did the, the, uh, the work I showed you on generalizability. Um, this is uh, Atsushi Kikimoto, um, who did the uh, EEG work and the conjunction representation work I showed you. Uh, Haley Keglovitz is a, a graduate student in the lab who's really um, been working on uh, the method side of the, uh, our ability to, to estimate dimensionality in PFC. And Apurva um, Bandari um, has been working a lot on the fMRI work, but also I think has just been the intellectual force behind a lot of these ideas. He's been collaborating on the project with at Sushi and um, has been at the base of this uh, throughout. And so I want to credit him as well. And as well as our collaborators, Ulrich Meyer, Stefano Fusi, Matthew Rigotti. And thanks to all of you for your, for your attention. A wonderful question. And that's something that um, I know Eric Schumacher and, and, and Elliot also have thought about. You have thought about this as well. But um, so you probably have more thoughts than I do. But um, the, uh, I, I, you know, I, in my mind, this is um, you need both of those, right? So you need the kinds of abstract, you still need the abstract representations. And we see evidence of them the rule, the stimulus, and so forth as, as components that drive the, the integration, right? So um, the fact that, you're, that we're forming integrated representation doesn't mean that we don't also have the need for maintaining and, and having interactions between or decisions about these other kinds of representations. So that's one thing to say. What we haven't done yet, and we actually have a plan to run this experiment, is look at a hierarchically structured task um, where there is a clear higher order dimension right, that separates out separate um, uh, integrated separate task files. Because that would be a case where you might have asymmetry in the, uh, in the, um, in the separation. In other words, you have more separation along the higher order dimension than you do along the lower order ones. And that would be advantageous for the system. And that would be interesting to know if that late, you know, ended up with different systems representing you know, different levels of that, right? You, you know, you know, along you know, the roster cuddle hierarchy, for example, or if that was found within the, within the geometry of the, of the integrated representation itself. And so, um, I have more questions than answers, I guess, in, in response to your question, but I think that it's a good one, and that's obviously something we need to test. Yeah, that's a fantastic question. And one thing I think I should say is these things aren't mutually exclusive, right? You could have dynamics within you know, population and still have what I think you're getting at is that not giving up the ability to say generalize as you built a high dimensional representation. So, so like one idea, right, it could be that if you have, um, uh, a low dimensional representation, right, that's communicating with, say, a population that's representing those task files, right, that or another, some other region that is, you know, represents these in a lower way, it could generate classes, right? So essentially, like, it's like if you had a, a, re a reduction in the dimensions as you go, as you propagate from the task file representations to those, it's essentially you could, you could have, it could have classes of those task files, right? And it allows it to make decisions about those, about those classes. And so here's, if, I mean, one example could be, um, Chris more often asked me about this, right? That at Brown, it's, it's you know, there's more, it's sort of a reduction in neurons as you go from cortex to striatum. So here's an interesting idea, right? Would be that, you know, if, if the striatum had essentially a low dimensional representation of what's in cortex, right? Then its decision, if it's doing gating or amplification of these sorts of things, it's doing it based on a sort of a class of cortical representation instead of a specific, instead of a specific cortical representation. So that's gonna be more important early on Right, in tasks where you have to kind of construct a trajectory than it will be later when those representations might be strong enough to care for themselves. Now, I don't have evidence of any of that. I'm just giving that as an example of the kind of dynamic that, that yeah, I think you're getting at, right? And so I think it's, it's very possible. So we're now actually, we've, we're doing both in complement. So we're doing both pattern-based and repetition suppression. Because So we start out much more repetition suppression because we found that pattern reliability was lowering in, in, frontal, in frontal cortex than it was in other parts of the brain, right? But there are disadvantages to the repetition suppression method, right? The whole, that aren't part of the, the, um, the, the pattern-based 
uh, methods. So now we're actually trying to do both and find ways to integrate them based on uh, estimates of noise and variance. So you basically create an, you integrate uh, the, both results based on sort of their how much noise they have um, and how reliable they are. And you try to do that around the cortex because one of the problems is also you want to do region to region comparison. Right. Like if you have differences, in, if I want to say, oh look, I found evidence of a high dimensional representation in PSC, but not in um, in you know parietal cortex or something, right? You have to. That's assuming that you have the same noise because the, all these all these methods are very sensitive to noise, right? And so you, if you don't, if you have different reliabilities in those, that can drive those those effects. So we're we're actually trying to find ways to use both in complement right now as well, because they have they have different. They're sensitive to different aspects of the noise, right? And so that can be helpful. Yeah, that's that's a great question. So I think there 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 would be right if we you know and we we spent a lot of time trying to think of the way to test this in the in the lab, right? But I mean I do think that it's I, mean, I guess a couple of things are in that question. So I don't think this is an explicit strategic thing on the part of the subject in the sense that they decide to form a high dimensional or not. It it seems to that the high dimensional representations form obligatorily in this task, right? We didn't do anything special to to make that happen per se. That being said, you probably could bias people towards. Uh, we think, right, to, to the, such that the, their behavior is determined more by, high, by the strength of that representation, depending on the task you give them, right? So if it's a task, for example, where the context, you know, like the incongruent condition of a Stroop task or a flanker task or someplace where there's, where there's conflict, a lot of overlap, and you really need the context to distinguish conditions, then your behavior should be more determined by the high dimensional representation in that condition than it would be in a case where, where the environment has separated the, um, those outcomes for you. So even though you might even find evidence for it in both cases, behavioral variance would be determined by in the former case than the latter case. I think. And we're trying to test that hypothesis actually directly right now. 